Yeah. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Welcome to That Solution Seems Sketchy, Engaging Students' Artistic and Creative Thinking to Arrive at Prototypes. So this is session three in, uh, today in our Invention Education track. Hopefully you're having a good time. My name is Nick Cruz. I'm from New Mexico Mesa here in Santa Fe, where we've got some rain the last few days, which is, uh, has been a bit unusual. It's beautiful here. Uh, hopefully you're having a good day. And uh, so we're going to go through an, a number of slides, do a few activities, and uh, hopefully you'll learn some things. Um, okay, so like we did in the previous session, if you were there, we just said do a quick review that uh, today, session one, from global to local, UN sustainability goals. Uh, probably a lot of you saw that one, and then you also saw the last, you were part of the last session, interviewing and problem statements. And here we are in session three, sketching and prototyping. And uh, make sure to keep an eye out tomorrow for session four in the morning, initial implementation of invention education coming from Colorado, Rocky Mountain, Mesa. Um, that should be good, I'm pretty sure in the morning. And then session five in the afternoon, uh, sharing a, a curriculum and vision for invention education with Oregon Mesa. And thanks to Oregon Mesa in general for sharing so much over the years about invention education. And so that's, uh, we're, we're going to take it a little further here with the idea of uh, prototyping and in, in involving a little bit of art if we can. Um, so I have a few slides here. We're going to get to some uh, quick activities, but a few slides here when talking to students about uh, if they are inventors or they're, they're studying science or engineering, why should they care about art? And uh, of course we have one of the greats, Leonardo da Vinci, who had, uh, he was, he had wonderful artistic skills to begin with, but he was also an inventor. And so this is a good example. You all could do uh, many lessons just on da Vinci alone, but uh, you know, he had some amazing ideas that came into his head and he used his, his artistic skills to uh, realize those ideas and go from there to create prototypes or in recent years um, prototypes or models of his ideas have been created um, so that's just a little visual there but i wanted to tell you a little bit about um, how our brain might work when we're getting into this so uh, rex young a professor of neuro neurosurgery here at university of new mexico says when an idea is incubating you rely heavily on the neural connections your brain uses for brainstorming a system known as the default mode network. You use the regions of the brain involved in daydreaming and imagination. You're looking inward instead of solving the problems of the world. That allows ideas to bounce around and intersect in novel ways. Neurologically, the creative process should look the same regardless of whether a person is an artist or a scientist, Jung says. And researchers have just begun to see this creativity in real time. Charles Lim, a surgeon at Johns Hopkins University, scanned musicians' brains as they improvised melodies and asked rap artists to improvise on the fly. Um, researchers found that the improvising brains turned off their error checkers and let the ideas bubble to the surface while they were in earlier stages. If they studied scientists, researchers might see the same neurological activity. So. Uh, we're kind of going through kind of quick. I'd love to hear opinions and experiences with this all, but we're going to keep going. Um, you know, there's so much to talk about or start to consider when talking about how do we, uh, we have a group of students, they have a problem to solve or they have an idea for an invention. How do we get that down on paper and start to sketch out ideas? Um, and this, you know, this reinforcing here, uh, that should be kind of a circle of arrows, but whether you're daydreaming or brainstorming, prototyping, creating something as an artist. That's a lot of the same thing happening in the brain and they can all inspire each other when they're happening. It's kind of a, a circle or a cycle that's happening. And so I wanted to move on quickly to a few examples of uh, a few things we've done here. Uh, when talking about STEAM education, the idea of putting art in STEM education. And to me, it comes down to uh, maybe the basic idea of uh, teaching art with science or science with art. It can go both ways. You can be in an art class and, and involve science, but um, there's, a, there's a big range of how complex you can get with it. It could be something as simple as 
uh, we're looking at slides in biology, I'm going to have the students uh, make a little art piece based on what they see, but it can get more complex. And uh, the more you interconnect the, the subjects, uh, it seems to me that the more uh, students can retain the things that they're learning, they experience them in different ways and the different learning styles are engaged and hopefully all students are engaged at that point. So something we did here in Santa Fe, circus arts and physics, the, the students worked with a uh, circus performer from Colombia that's here in Santa Fe. And, um, you know, this is also a physical thing too, physical education possibly, but we're, he talked a lot about the artistic side of being a circus performer and they, they had fun working on these different things that you see here, but we also, uh, worked on the uh, standards, middle school standards for physics. And I would imagine or would hope that the students retained a lot of that, uh, things about kinetic energy, air resistance, gravity, Newton's laws, and they might be more likely to remember them or at least had a good time learning them as they were going through it. And uh, another example, fiber arts and chemistry. They worked with this fiber artist who was here from Israel and they worked on harvesting wool and uh, dyeing it, processing it, looking at a mi microscope, uh, creating a piece of art. And in the, throughout the process, talking about some of the chemistry involved and some biology involved as well. So uh, just, this is just a, a moment here to uh, maybe inspire you to look at ideas. Uh, it's like the, the sky's the limit. What can you do to involve um, different things that that might engage a student who is in your science class or in your, your MESA program that uh, can learn in different ways and is, is inspired by doing something artistic. Um, so uh, let me back up before you read that. So to, to introduce this, um, so if we get into the idea of uh, imagine, we imagine you all are a group of students and I'm the teacher and we're saying, okay, we have this, uh, invention, this idea, we need to start sketching ideas. Um, well, in any group, probably you have people that say, I'm not a, an artist, I can't even draw a smiley face or a stick figure in it. You're telling me that I have to draw an idea and I, I hope I don't have to show it to everyone, that would be even worse. Um, and then there's a range and you have other people that say, oh yeah, I love drawing and uh, I, that's, that's great, I'm excited and I'm good at drawing or whatever. So, but this is kind of a, a fun activity. Uh, the idea reminded to me by Kim Shear, who I think is here, Kim Shear of New Mexico Mesa. And uh, so we're going to get going with this, the idea of blind contour drawing. Hopefully everyone has a piece of paper and pen or pencil or any drawing implement. So I'll, I'll read you, I'm going to give you two minutes, but I'll read you here. We're going to draw an object without looking at your paper. And I have the object here. I'll show you. It's a, a picture of a lamp. Um, so you have your paper, you'll look at the lamp and you'll draw, you'll have two minutes to draw it without looking at your paper. Focus on the contour and shape of the object without worrying about your technical skills. Blind contour drawing creates a shift from left mode to right mode thinking. The left mode of the brain rejects meticulous complex perception of spatial and relational information, consequently permitting the right brain to take over. Uh, this comes from Betty Edwards' drawing on the right side of the brain, which I'll mention at the end in the resources. Um, again, uh, focusing on, so whether you're a great artist or you never draw, we're all on the same page. We're going to look at this lamp and don't look at your paper, but really look at the image on the screen and focus on the contour, the shape, and we'll see what happens. Um, just a second here. I'm going to start this timer when it comes up here and maybe, uh, uh let's see how our time is doing. Maybe we can all just rather than sharing individually, hold up our, our piece of art at the end. So I'll start the two minutes now. problem with the timer here it looks like but I'm going to give you another one minute uh, 
starting now. Fifteen seconds left. Okay, that's two minutes. So uh, hopefully you uh, maybe were even a bit amused by what you produced. And if everyone can real quick hold up to the screen so we can all see, what do you have? Maybe we can see it or not, but. Uh, well, that's amazing. You all did that without looking. I've seen it before where uh, things end up all over the place and overlapping and everything, but uh, yeah, it all looks good. Okay, you're on your way as artists. We have one more uh, activity to do here. So um, to take it a bit further, another fairly simple one though is continuous line drawing. And it can be very beautiful and minimalist and simple. This I love this uh, rose over here on the side. The idea, draw a picture with only one unbroken line. Continuous line drawing encourages the artist to closely observe the perceived lines of the subject. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you another image on the screen. Um, this is a good drawing exercise for developing hand-eye coordination and observation skills. So let's move on to the next image of a plant. And you, you are allowed to look at the paper. Uh, let's see, I'm waiting for this timer here. You are allowed to look at your paper, but you're, you're focusing on trying to keep it all one continuous unbroken line. And let's see what you create. Okay, Whoa. there's time, time's up. So once again, if everyone can sh share your creations.
Beautiful. That's really nice. And I saw um, a few people with a tablet, a device, phone or screen. Uh, great. A different way to draw. Okay. So we will move on here to our problem statements. Now, uh, I think that many of you, if not most, were in the previous workshop where you worked on a problem statement. And our facilitator, Rudy, is here, and he was uh, kind enough to offer to uh, be involved here to, to transition us. Uh, Rudy, what can you say about this? Maybe get them going on the problem statements. And I think you have the link. Yes, let me go ahead and copy that and I'll paste it in the chat in just a second. Thanks. And so we're going to take five minutes. I have a timer here. Hopefully it'll work. But uh, so so if you were not in the previous workshop, no problem. We have uh, Rudy will po po uh, post the link and we can take five minutes to read through the problem statements that were created. And from there, we will take it into uh, drawing and realizing a prototype. Oh, I believe I just shared it in the chat there. Hopefully everybody's able to see that. So uh, I think Rudy, that as they're reading this, they should start thinking about um, what they might want to uh, invent. Yeah, so so I'll just quickly mention uh, what Nick mentioned earlier. Earlier, there was a session where we had an opportunity uh, to interview uh, each other as clients. And the topic was um, we were trying to get at what their experience was cooking at home. And there were specific. Um, so as we were listening, um, people put together um, problem statements that tried to identify the individual's need and kind of um, why that was important to them. Um, so those um, problem statements are captured there. You can read through all of them. You can treat them as one kind of big problem statement, or you could decide like, this is the one that's calling towards me. And I, I think I've got some ideas of some things that I might be able to create to help to design a solution for that person. And then I think we'll move into some sketching activities. Okay, so we'd like to take five minutes, Rudy. Yes, Is that correct. Yes, okay. So here we go. I'll get the timer going. Thanks.
And our time is up on that one. So we'll move on to uh, writing down design ideas. We'll have three minutes to do that. Uh, after reviewing the problem statements, what de design ideas might you have? And uh, did you have anything to add to that, Rudy? No, I think this is just kind of after having reviewed um, the problem statements, where do you think that you could kind of uh, move next in terms of sketching a solution, but what will be important in that solution that you've gotten from the problem statement, so, yeah. And uh, I've been forgetting along the way to ask if we have any questions about this or anything else, maybe other things we can get to at the end, but any questions about this so far? Okay, we'll start the, uh, the timer and let us know if you have questions along the way. Okay, time's up on that one. Moving on. Okay, so this is our Crazy Eights activity. Participants are given 60 second intervals to arrive at eight different sketches of design solutions. Um, you can see a graphic here uh, indicating how you should divide up your paper into eight squares. And I'll let uh, Rudy explain a bit more about the activity. Well, I think the um, activity is just trying to get us to um, think about what could different solutions look like. Um, and so um, you're trying to get more than just one solution. Uh, oftentimes we might kind of draw something and say like, okay, that's it. 
Um, but this is actually trying to get us to be creative, uh, to think outside of these eight boxes to some extent, um, uh, and to do so with a limited amount of time. Um, so I think Nick and I had decided we might go ahead and give us five one minute, um, uh, five sets of one minute, where during that one minute, you're gonna go ahead and try to sketch out a solution um, to um, the problem that you've decided to address. And then um, at the end of that minute, Nick will let us know, we'll jump to a second one. We'll go all the way through five. They usually recommend uh, trying to get to eight, um, but because of our workshop time, we're gonna to try to do five today. Yes, and uh, keep in mind, we like this 60, 60 second interval. It's, it's good to have kind of rush a bit and just get the ideas out, no wrong answer. It's good to be pushed a little bit rather than having an uh, unlimited time. So we're going to stick to the one minute. Here we go with sketch number one. Great. Time's up, on to sketch number two. Time's up, sketch number three. Time's up, sketch number four.
Time's up. One more left. Number five. And I'm having trouble with the timer. I'll manually set it here. One minute. Go. Ten seconds remaining. And that is time. Okay, on to our solution sketch, Rudy. Thanks, Nick. Uh, so uh, I'll just. Shoot, sorry about that, Rudy. No problem. That's my my fault. Um, so just wanted to say um, that uh, some of the the um, strategies that we're using um, are come from uh, both the invention education, um, but I also looked at a book called uh, that's called Sprint: How to Solve Big Problems and Test New Ideas in Just Five Days. Um, so it's a design sprint book um, that kind of focuses a lot, you know, similar to invention education, map, sketch, decide, prototype, and test. And so um, they talk about kind of, um, again, something, um, the opportunity to kind of get to um, sketching some different uh, ver uh, variations, but then to get to the point where you're actually kind of moving towards a solution sketch. So this is where you might look at each of your previous sketches and say like, well, I like this part of this, uh, but maybe not this part. Um, and kind of looking at those five different variants that you have there, what is that ultimate variant that you might put forward as a solution sketch? Um, you want the this uh, solution sketch, um, we'll go ahead and start the timer and you can start to work on it. Um, you want the solution sketch to go ahead and be self-explanatory. Hopefully everybody can kind of look at it and be able to kind of tell um, what it's supposed to do um, fairly easily. Um, you want it to be anonymous because at, at times you may be sharing this, right? We might have students share their ideas with others. Um, and so if there's anonymity, there, there might not be a tie to somebody's um, design because they know that person. Um, ugly is okay. Um, so, you know, we're going to do our best to kind of get the idea out there and have it act, um, have it be an idea in concept, and then we'll then move towards prototyping it, and we can make it as um, beautiful as we'd like at that point, um, but ugly is okay. Um, words can be used because sometimes, again, um, it's nice if it's self-explanatory, but sometimes um, certain words can kind of help to just easily convey uh, an idea. And if you can, give it a catchy title. Um, so um, you're almost kind of creating like what I feel might be like the first uh, mini poster uh, for your design solution. Um, so we're going to have everybody use the remaining four minutes um, to do that um, with your ideas.
Bill will have about a minute. And in a moment, um, I think Nick may encourage us to kind of share either sketches or if you have kind of an idea and concept that's been hard to sketch, that might just be for me because I, I that, that's just me. Um, then you can pop that into the chat or um, I'm sure that Nick will give us an opportunity to kind of share some of those design sketches that you might've come up with. So got 45 seconds. Okay, time's up on that one, and we will stop sharing and ask everyone to hold up some of what you have. Very cool. Does somebody want to um, share briefly uh, your design solution there? I took some of everything of when I read it. And this sounds like one of my problems because I'm not a breakfast person. So I designed a pill breakfast. You have your potatoes, your eggs, your bacon in a pill with a glass of water. <laughs> <laughs> And you called it in a snap, is that right? In a snap. <laughs> there you go. Awesome. Awesome. Anybody else like to share? Um, good afternoon. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. All right. So I guess this is my design solution for the problem for the previous activity. So I called it um, universal baking measuring device. So we're in, just like in baking, so everything must be accurate. So you can, uh, there is a machine in here where in you can put, uh, you know, um, you don't need to measure the flour, the sugar and everything. So you just need to press a button. So which, um, you know, uh, I mean the measurement of the ingredients and it will actually go down to, um, there is, um, tube in here wherein mm -hmm. it will give you an exact amount of the ingredients you need. So you don't need, even though, for example, you need two tablespoons of this kind of ingredient. So you can put like one pound, but once you press two uh, tablespoons, so it will give you two tablespoons. You don't need to, you know, um, to hassle, to have a lot of problems in measuring. It's a universal Great. measuring device. Awesome. Very good. Thank you. Maybe Wonderful. one more. I could share mine. Really. Great. Thank you. So let's see. Uh, you guys can see that. Yes. Um, I decided to call it the, um, the unsmoker or not smoker. Uh -huh. So it's a hood that goes over. You, you bring your grill inside and the hood that goes over it. And it's got a complicated filtering system that'll take all the smoke and filter out everything and uh, make it safe to grill indoors. I'm assuming charcoal grilling. Very good. Uh, gas grill. Uh, although my crazy idea that I liked better was instead of a light saber, a light spatula. And you just smack it onto your meat and then you're cooked. And then if any sits show up, you can fight them off too. There you go. <laughs> this is the way. Thank you, Manny. I'll turn it back over to Nick. <laughs> Wonderful. You all are artists and inventors. I can see. Maybe you already knew that. Uh, oh, shared the wrong thing here. Um, trying to get back to the PowerPoint. We have just about, uh, well, six minutes. Was hoping to get to talking about resources. 
I think we need to be done at uh, 255, correct? Uh, yes, 255. We want to make sure to get to our final closing remarks. So uh, we have a few things listed here. This PowerPoint will be available to anyone who would like it. Uh, and uh, so we have a few things here. The, the processing I was going to show you, but you can check it out, processing.org. Also, this link here um, is a tutorial uh, kind of made for me to go through it, but you can at least look at it and it has a lot of other resources if you're interested in learning the uh, coding called processing where you can create visual images. Um, and there's also this brain drawing on the right uh, book, drawing on the right side of the brain. A link here, a uh, really wonderful thing for st starting to talk about how the brain works when you're being creative. Um, but if we can take just a few minutes to look at Tinkercad, which I'm sure uh, a lot of you know about. Um, our friend and colleague Case from Rhode Island, Mesa, is here and he has pointed out some things about uh, Tinkercad that can be useful in this context. Uh, many of you know you can design things, uh, you can go on to to Tinkercad and um, design things to be sliced and 3D printed. That can be very useful. Uh, you can also use it though. Uh, I am currently working on a remodeling a shed that will be a, like a studio office space. And so it's really useful to uh, create a prototype this way. Uh, it's moving kind of slowly here. Create a prototype with exact measurements, which uh, these are not exact, actually exact, but uh, I started out with the basics and then I can uh, refine it and get into exact measurements and really visualize and uh, do things like show my wife who's really specific on exactly where a window would be or mm -hmm. how big the door would be. And so uh, that's kind of neat. Um, there are a ton of tutorials online and on YouTube and other places where you can learn about this. Uh, one other thing I wanted to point out that uh, Case told me about is this uh, function here where you can get into block coding. And uh, people who know about uh, coding know that uh, it can be uh, much more efficient rather than just um, dragging some shapes onto the screen and uh, making an image. It's a little more complex at first. But you can do this block coding and it'll create this uh, here's a tree um, we'll create this tree and in the long run if i'm doing lots of images a complex project if i want to change just one parameter change the uh, radius of this circle here it's kind of just one or two changes and it can change a lot more a lot more quickly and we can work more efficiently it's also a great way to get kids into coding if you haven't already done that and you're interested. Uh, but I wanted to turn it over to, to Case, who I think is here. Did you have anything to add on that, Case? Well, the the really cool thing is that you can now, um, I don't know if everybody can see that, but uh, slightly to the right above that tree, you see the word export. And if you click on that, you can actually export this as a shape. So uh, you can also export it as a printable file but if you click on shape, you, it will then show up as a shape in your 3D design. And you can then, you know, use this one shape repeatedly in a design. Um, and you don't have to constantly construct it over and over again or copy paste. You can just create your own shapes. Uh, they could be parts, you know, for a design, uh, let's say cogs or other kinds of parts. And uh, I think um, uh, Nick sort of uh, made the, uh, uh, we sort of brainstormed the idea of a, a, a street and he can drag in a tree and put it in the street and he can put just as many trees as he wants. These are now scalable objects. Uh, he can put in houses, he can, um, you know, they can be scaled to keep uh, lots of things. You can uh, change the colors on them and so on, like any of the other sub objects. So um, this is really good for prototyping because if you, you know, if you decide that, hey, wait a minute, you know, uh, we want to make some changes, uh, you can go and change your object around and then, um, and then save it again as an object that you can just repeatedly use. So you can see how quickly you can customize things and 
and make it your own design. So I really like this aspect. It is, um, it makes things very quick and, uh, and also, you know, it, it allows for much more fluidity and creativity without getting um, hunkered down on details. <laughs> thanks so much, Case. Uh, great working with you on this and thanks for sharing. And uh, so uh, just quickly mention this slide. Make sure to keep an eye out for the sessions tomorrow. They should be great. There's also a parking lot for uh, questions and comments. You can, uh, here's the QR code if you'd like to find it that way. Here's the link, uh, maybe I can put it in the chat. Um, and while I'm thinking of it, this presentation uh, will be available. Rudy, can you clarify where that will be? I don't think I saw that. I think we're gonna be sharing um, the uh, sharing information about where all the presentations will be available. Um, so that if there was another, if you're in this session, I had also hoped to be in the joining session, um, there'll be an opportunity to access those recordings as well. And then all of these will be kind of kept and will be sent out to participants. Okay, thanks, Rudy. And thanks everyone for being here. I wish you could all uh, participate more. If we were in person, we could see more of what you did today, but it was a quick little uh, summary here and uh, we need to get on to our next session closing remarks here's the link in the chat for that and uh thank you all for being here